mice, they've got huge numbers of ticks. Um, and so they're probably just passing it continuously um, from each other overall. And again, there's, they have the spark heat in their system without any symptoms at all. It doesn't hurt them. It's then it gets picked up and it gets to us. Um, liver, I, I think the whole issue of antibiotic residues, um, it's, there's, you can find some, but it's very, very small. And that's really not going to be an issue from a resistance standpoint. I don't, you know, don't want to scare anybody, but there's actually, you can find, if you go and you look in some foods, you can do analysis and find antibiotics um, because it can be in some of them. It's pretty low, though, and it's, again, it's not an issue as far as this topic. Thank you. Other questions? Well, <laughs> to, in terms of the, the antibiotics and the liver thing, I think that um, it's, it's kind of like the, the concept of, um, that people have of organic farming as, you know, oh, you don't spray pesticides, so I'm not eating pesticides. That's not true. We don't live in a pure world, and when you're choosing to buy organic food, you might, you, you probably are lowering your exposure to harmful residues. You are not eliminating them. When you're buying organic food, what you're doing is choosing a better system and voting for the system that you would like to see used in the world. If everybody adopted those systems, then we would live in a much purer world, though we would still be seeing the results of how we've been doing things for the last umpteen years, for centuries on. Um, but for me at least, uh, when, you know, I choose to farm organically, um, you know, not necessarily because I expect to eat clean food, when I live in a highly contaminated world, I don't think that, um, you know, I, I don't expect the way I eat to prevent me from ever getting cancer or anything like that. It's just that I'm voting for the way that I think that farming ought to be done. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also understand that as a biology teacher that bacteria are all over the place and all the way through our bodies and we need them to make um, vitamin K in our intestines. Can you talk a little bit about the antibiotic hand cleaners that have become so prevalent in the last 10 years and how they're increasing the resistance of bacteria to antibiotics? Maybe other things that people can do in their homes to learn to live with the bacteria that are out there? <laughs> Broad question, but let me take it and I'll take a shot and then s let's see what some other folks say. Um, hand sanitizers are actually alcohol, okay? So they're not anti, they're, most of them are not antiseptic. So it's al they're, al they're all alcohol based gels. Those are actually antiseptics, not antibiotics. Okay, so that's number one. Um, don't drink them, okay? That's uh, so, um, but they should be used for what they should be used for, which is that. They're especially useful in hospitals. That's why you see hospital hand gels, and that's why if you if you think back, um, I mean, I'm not sure when they started putting into like dial and all this other stuff. But if you think back actually to H1N1, and we had this really big concern about disease transmission, um, hand gels started springing up everywhere. I mean, that's when they started springing up in supermarkets, and I mean, they were more in like some of the lawyers' offices than they were in the doctors' offices. They were everywhere, um, and but recognize those are alcohol based which is not the same but the question is is what what do you need to do to keep yourself healthy as far as the bacteria in your body you should wash your hands before you eat it's like well, I think my mother said that my wife keeps telling me that I keep trying to and I'm an infectious disease guy um, <laughs> but um, but that's because you probably encounter an environment that is not clean but it's not your own bacteria um, most of the time Okay, and so um, that I think is a, those are different classes than antibiotics overall. So it's not driving the resistance issue. So that was a thumbs up for antiseptics. Well, it's, a, it's for the right situation. Okay. Yeah, it's a thumbs up. Um, so thumb, it's, not, it's a thumbs down for the spirochete. How's that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a firm believer in that expression. You gotta eat a peck of dirt before you die. That doesn't mean I don't wash my hands before I eat uh, or 
try to keep myself reasonably clean and one of the reasons is just because I'm a veterinarian and when I go farm to farm I try to maintain some sort of biosecurity so I disinfect my boots and I wear clean coveralls but I think we go overboard now with disinfectants and hand sanitizers and so forth uh, in my opinion and I don't know I have any data to back that up but um, it, it certainly seems like we've gone way overboard with that soap and warm water is, is great. <coughs> Yeah, I wanted to respond a bit more to Nancy's. There's a big difference between the alcohol-based hand sanitizers, which are not a problem, and the antibacterial soaps that are all over the place, and also in cosmetics that you find antibacterials. Um, in toothpaste, apparently a leading brand of toothpaste has this in it, and the FDA a spokesperson for the FDA has just asked the companies that advertise antibacterial soaps to prove that those are beneficial because the FDA says, as far as the research we've seen to date, regular soap is, is just as good as your antibacterial product. And there's, some, there's one um, component of some of those soaps called, I think it's triclosan, which has some real, real toxic toxicity issues. I don't know, I don't remember whether it's a neurotoxin or carcinogen, but, um, but I think that's the, what Nancy's point is, is the, uh, all of these dial products, etc., that are antimicrobial or antibacterial probably uh, are a waste of money at, at best. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't dispute that at all. I think that what that does is it raises just language. Okay, so let me, anti, there's antimicrobial and antibacterial and antibiotics, okay, and so we use those interchangeably. They're not, okay, and so, and or antiseptic, um, and so are antibiotics in the soaps? No, that's not what we, so, but there are compounds that are, have some antibacteria activity taking it from alcohol base, which we know alcohol actually is antibacterial. And that simply means, or antibiotic means it's against life. That's actually what antibiotic means, it, and it kills life. The only places that we really have data on that, and again, I, just I, to emphasize what you said, in the hospital environment, which is where we have the most problem with re transmitting bacteria, the only things we recommend are alcohol-based gels, uh, gels or hand washing, and we actually recommend hand washing first. It's just that it tends to be um, in a busy environment. If you can't do that, then they use the, uh, the uh, alcohol-based gels. Um, but what they put in all the other stuff are usually not considered in the classes of antibiotics we're talking about, but they do have, I don't doubt they might have toxic properties, and I'm sure they haven't been tested. Other questions from the audience? Come up. Come up or I'll repeat. I Ant antiseptics are chemical compounds that have um, activity against that are not that are not really killing bacteria other than through toxic effects. Um, so you think about I mean the classic one was like iodine, okay? That's um, and that we would not think that's not again you wouldn't be taking that orally for um, an infection, uh, but you would be when you have like we. You know, you put that on things to actually prevent the uh, in, the an, an infection from occurring. Antibacterial means that it's specifically it's a, it's actually against bacteria. Antibiotic means it's against life or life forms because we actually have antivirals which are against viruses, antifungals which are against fungi, um, and they're they're really parsing out some of the same terms. But I think you're actually getting at a really important point again because antiseptics are not we're not talking. We're not concerned about resistance to those because they're not used in the way that we're thinking about. But they're used to, to in a sense, they're trying to prevent uh, and clean a wound more than anything else. More questions from the audience? 
All right, I have a question. Um, there's some concern. I know that m many public health groups have said, boy, these FDA guidelines are a great first step. Um, I would like to hear from people on the panel, what, A, what the second step might be, and the pitfalls of voluntary guidelines. I know that, um, I can't remember which European country adopted a similar policy, no non-therapeutic use at all. And it didn't really make a big difference. Another country, its name I don't remember, but I'll bet Jen knows, uh, <laughs> said, look, we're just going to, we're, we have this policy and we're also going to put a limit on antibiotics in animals, period. And that worked. I know that's coming to me <laughs> first anyway. And, but, um, yeah, the uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, the FDA is taking uh, a good approach um, because they're saying, okay, um, the data the, the data is not overwhelming that there's a, a, a tremendous number of resistant infections being transferred from uh, animals to people. Yes, the data from North Carolina is is compelling and interesting that farm workers are showing up with MRSA on their skin, but are they are there treatment failures because of that? You know, is there a lot of disease because of that? Not to my knowledge. So I think that what FDA is doing is is kind of maybe taking the first step along the way, and then they're going to wait and see what happens. I mean, th these two steps that they're taking are 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 big, um, and um, the bill in Congress is. Is is black and white. That's bigger. I mean, the PAMTA, the preservation. It's, I don't think it's called that anymore. Um, but the the old bill, PAMTA, Preservations of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, would have removed all of these uh, antibiotics immediately, and it it hasn't gone anywhere in Congress because it's so drastic. And so I think what FDA is doing in their with their regulatory discretion is that they 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 can act without going through Congress and by rule, or actually it's not by rule, it's by compliance policy guideline, um, they can change their policy. And so they're saying we're going to remove these non-therapeutic claims, um, we're going to relabel them. If the companies put in the data to re they won't automatically all be relabeled for disease prevention, disease control. And the other thing that they've told me, and I've sat with a couple of the FDA, the heads of the FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine, they said this is not going to be business as normal. It's going to be, you know, it's not going to be antibiotic, non-therapeutic use without any time frame. They're going to say, if you're going to say you're going to treat, use these antib antibiotics therapeutically for prevention or control, there's going to be a time period on it. It's just not going to be for the life of the animal. So that's what I think is going to change. And number two is the veterinary oversight. So that has not been present, and that is a. I think it's been a black eye for the veterinary profession for a long time. Is that um, we've kind of tacitly gone along with that, um, and now it's not going to be that way anymore. So I am optimistic about this, um, and I think that uh, it's it's very encouraging that immediately all 26 drug manufacturers came on board. They had 90 days to decide, and within 90 days, 25 out of 26 said, yep, we're going to do it, and then the 26th company came on board, I think, within a month. So, you know, they're doing it. Yes, it's voluntary, but they're all doing it. So, it's going to happen. <laughs> um, I, I, too, am optimistic, maybe just slightly more skeptical, um, and I think that's just from sort of the history of voluntary measures, you know, across a variety of different issues. So it is absolutely promising that um, that all the different companies have said that they're that they're going to comply 
Um, I'll feel better when things are further in motion. Um, and um, I feel like the, the tracking and transparency in use is a, is a huge, huge piece of it. So what systems get put in place for, for that component so we can better understand what's being used and what quantities, you know, what animals and, and what have you, um, I think will we'll go a long way for a better understanding the issues. Um, I um, would, as an organization and as an individual, would lean more towards the direction of um, making it mandatory as opposed to voluntary, um, mostly because I think that because bacteria can evolve so quickly um, and that we want to be acting more from a precautionary principle standpoint. Um, so if the evidence is leaning in that direction, even if folks don't all think it's overwhelmingly um, concrete evidence, I would argue for better to take um, precautionary measures as opposed to wait for, um, for more bacteria to evolve or for, um, for it to become a larger problem. Um, in, 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 the, in the countries that have stopped the non-therapeutic use, has there been any real evidence that the animals aren't growing as fast? Or was the whole thing a scam to begin with? It, well, I, mean, I don't know what the evidence from Denmark is, but it is, it is not just an excuse. The, the, they do speed growth, I think, you know, without, and I don't know if you would, I, I, from what I understand, it's sort of without question that they do do that. I think it goes to um, the questions of what are appropriate conditions to be raising animals in and what type of food system do we want to see, but do they actually promote growth? I think the question is yes. I mean, the answer is yes. In the case of Denmark, um, it, it's a big experiment going on right now, and it's been going on for about 14 years, and initially um, they were using a, a, a tremendous quantity of, an, quantity of antibiotics for non-therapeutic uses. When that ban went into effect, antibiotic use in, in livestock dropped uh, precipitously, but then um, therapeutic use went up, so treatment uses went up because farmers had to figure out how to adapt to the new reality of not having this crutch to to fall back on. So treatment uses went up. More animals got sick, more animals died. And from what I can gather in, co in talking to colleagues who have been to Denmark, and, I've, and I know a couple of veterinarians who have been there on a couple of different visits, the data is, the data is not black and white. It kind of depends upon, you know, they say where you, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And, um, I think you know if you are if you are a, a consumer um, with a consumer group, you can spit you can look at the data and you know say it shows one thing. If you're maybe somebody in my profession who's maybe a little bit more um, guarded about how I might view that, um, you might say, well, we haven't seen that much change, say in resistance trends overall in that country. From what I can gather in talking to people here, again, I haven't been there and I haven't reviewed the data in any detail myself, so I'm speaking just from the experience of colleagues who have been there. Um, so, anyway, that's my take on that Denmark data, anyway. I really know nothing about the animal feed in Denmark, but I think <laughs> the other thing that's important is Denmark has also put in very strong controls on human use of antibiotics at the same time. So if you look, and you because mentioned, you mentioned MRSA rates, that's methicillin resistant staph, it's a bad bacteria. The rates of the staph being resistant are between five and 10% in Denmark, and they're between 50, 40 to 50 to 60% in the United States. So there's some very interesting data. How it all rela it relates, and I think that's the, one of the hardest things is that these types of endpoints are so complex from the inputs. So changing one thing, I mean, there's actually multiple changes that are going on, and I think it does give us a great place to look 
and to ask the questions and try to actually prove some of these things. So I have a great, great quote um, that I, since it's, it's not the end yet, but I, it just occurred to me because uh, I heard a friend of mine, a colleague of mine from Texas Tech, Guy Lonergan, he's a, he's a beef um, PhD down there. And he made the comment that if you think you understand antimicrobial resistance, it has not been properly explained to you. <laughs> so if you think, you're, you're, if your heads are turning, you're a little bit confused, you're shaking your heads, you're in good company. It's a very, very complicated topic. Um, I, I've been starting, starting to write a blog when my extension job, and it, it took me all summer to draft this blog that I put out this week on Monday or Tuesday um, because I just dreaded writing it because it was just like, how am I going to do this in five to six hundred, seven hundred words? And I did, but it's not great. So where, where are we yeah, it's on the extension website, main extension.edu. Yeah, just, yeah, it's on there. <laughs> More questions from the audience? Uh, well, a lot of those are answered in the handout, so I... <laughs> um, you have a couple here. Okay. Um, I just wanted to respond to one of the points that you made about um, the fact that typically organic meat products are going to be more expensive and sort of how do we address the issue of accessibility when this is something that, you know, I think we do want to be accessible to everyone as we're in the process of transforming the food system from where it is now to you know, where we hope it will be. Um, and one of the approaches that Healthcare Without Harm takes is called the balanced menu approach. Um, and so one thing that we suggest to people is um, to sort of evaluate your overall diet. And certainly one thing that Americans on average are not deficient in is protein. Um, we, we eat more than our fair share of that. And so one thing that I would consider people to do is look at perhaps having one serving less of meat a week and having that be a higher quality option. So that's one way of trying to sort of balance your food budget. I think that's an excellent recommendation. Eat less meat and make it good meat. Um, I just wanted to throw my two cents in towards the uh, what, what should be done about the antibiotic issue and um, play devil's advocate a little bit on the um, mandatory antibiotic use um, or, or you know disuse of antibiotics being mandatory. Uh, because there's been a lot of um, government regulation handed down to farmers that most MOFCA people are aware are not scale appropriate, things like the Food Safety Modernization Act. And I think that this would be another instance of that. Um, as much as I respect the medical profession, part of the reason that we have antibiotic resistance is because there are doctors, you walk into their office with a common cold and say, I want antibiotics. They say, that's a virus, it won't work. You say, I don't care, I want them anyway. And they give you the antibiotics. Similarly, a lot of the huge pork farms and you know all of the, the really large scale industrial livestock farms, they have veterinarians on their staff and you'd better believe that they are going to get antibiotics whenever they want them, in my opinion, at least a lot more likely. I do not have a veterinarian on my staff. Um, Don has been extraordinarily helpful to me in the last year, figuring out problems that we've been having and how to prevent them and how to make them go away. Um, and you know, the expertise of a veterinarian is is crucial when you need it. Um, in the case of a small farmer, it can also often be very expensive. Um, luckily, I got Don in his capacity as an extension agent, so that was, thank you, taxpayer. <laughs> but, what, you know, if I had to call, you know, if I had a sick animal, you know, I, I've been farming for 10 years. I know what a case of acute erysipelas looks like, and I know I need to get penicillin into that animal, or it's going to die soon. And I would feel pretty resentful if I had to incur a $200 vet bill before I could treat that animal. 
I don't have a good solution for that, but if you've got mandatory veterinary oversight before somebody can use an antibiotic for therapeutic purposes, I don't think that's solving the situation if the big guys can still get antibiotics whenever they want them and I'm prevented from treating a sick animal potentially because I'm a small farm and they're big. <laughs> that's a great point because remember, this policy is only going to apply for non-therapeutic use. So remember I said that you can get antibiotics, a lot of antibiotics in animal agriculture over the counter. You're still going to be able to get penicillin. Okay, that that they haven't proposed to change that yet. That probably will be would be next, I think. Remember I said any antibiotic used in, in, in livestock and poultry since nineteen ninety three has been by prescri prescription only. Or veterinary feed directive. So they're not changing the the policy for therapeutic drugs. This is for non therapeutic. And the other thing that I don't know whether it follows on this or not, but I wish that we had a policy for organic that like we used to have that still allowed a double withholding time because um, that would allow somebody like Alice who's an organic producer and we did have that before the national organic standards and um, and I think that makes perfect sense um, because that these residues especially if you treat you know treat an animal like that with a, a pig with erysipelas that penicillin's going to be gone. I mean, it's not it's not there for the life of the animal, but if she treats that animal, it's out of the organic stream forever. Forever. Even if it was a 16-week-old yeah, pig and it's going to be a breeder. It's out it's done. It can't be antibiotic. You're done. I'm done. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> um I'd like I, some more ideas in the five minutes that we have left. Um, oh, oh, no, no. no. Heather says we don't have we're any done, time. Done. I said done. They told me we're done. Okay. Um, Sorry. Thank you very, very much. People over there. People want to ask questions over there. The panel will be here for five minutes. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And if anybody wants the handouts from the back table, over on the table. Yes. <laughs>